much about uh, the geometry of um, So, my name is Jens Heber. I'm a participant uh, of this exciting conference on geometry, topology, and um, the dynamics in negative curvature, which takes place these days for one whole week in Bangalore at the Raman Research Institute. Uh, since uh, not only participants, not only mathematicians are in the audience, I should maybe explain what this conference is about. It's a satellite conference to the International Congress of Mathematicians, which um, most, pre most prestigious congress uh, uh, in mathematics, or at least in as far as pure mathematics is concerned. And uh, this congress takes place uh, every four years and um, will be hosted by India this year for the very first time and will in fact take place in Hyderabad soon. And um, on behalf of all participants of this satellite conference, I would first like to thank the Raman Research Institute for their hospita hospitality uh, that we may use this wonderful location um, for our conference. And I uh, would also like to thank the local organizers, uh, Professor Aravinda from Tata Institute and Professor Joseph Samuel from uh, um, Raman Research Institute uh, and many of their colleagues for uh, a wonderful job they are doing with the perfect organization we enjoy these days. Um, it was... <laughs> Uh, so it was the wish both of the organizing committee and of the Raman Research Institute that uh, the conference should also contain a public lecture uh, addressed to a wider audience. And it's my honor and particular pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce the speaker of this public lecture, Professor Patrick Eberlein. He's from uh, UNC, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the United States. Uh, let me uh, give you some details about the Vita and his work. Uh, uh, Professor Eberlein obtained his undergraduate degree at Harvard University in 1965, then his MA at University of Car uh, um, California at Los Angeles um, in uh, his MA in uh, 67, and at the same place he um, was uh, rewarded his PhD um, awarded his uh, PhD um, in 1970. His advisor was Professor Barrett O'Neill. And since there are physicists in the audience, uh, some of you uh, may also know the books of Barrett O'Neill on differential geometry and its applications to general relativity. Uh, so Professor Eberlein has been working on many different aspects of geometry, topology, and dynamics of um, spaces of negative curvature. I would like to point out his major contributions, for example, to dynamical be behavior of the geodesic flow of uh, such spaces, or his contributions to symmetry groups of lattice type uh, in negatively curved spaces. He has obtained several important characterizations of model symmetry, so-called rigidity results, uh, and has in recent years contributed to a deeper understanding of geometry and dynamics of Neil manifolds. His results have been published in all major journals in the field. He has had six PhD students and uh, six co-authors so far. We are glad, Pat, that you have accepted uh, the invitation of the organizing committee to give the public lecture, and we are now looking forward to your talk on ergodic behavior in negative curvature. Well, after such a nice introduction, I feel more pressure than ever. Uh, <laughs> so um, I've been asked to give a public lecture. This is my first, and I don't know exactly what it means. Um, this is also my first uh, venture into electronic presentation, so um, we'll see how it goes. Um, I want to thank also for myself the organizers, and especially Yaravinda, whom I've known for many years. The conference has been wonderful. Thank you.
So um, I want to talk about something, a paper in particular, that I spent a lot of time on when I was uh, completing my PhD. <clears throat> it's a paper of Eberhard Hopf. Um, uh, it's the paper that led to many developments in dynamical systems. And in this paper, he explains uh, how to prove uh, the ergodic behavior of the geodesic flow on a compact or finite volume, finite area negatively curved manifold. Um, and I hope this historical insight will uh, be useful. Um, I've included some very crude graphics. And there's nothing, unfortunately, more complicated than a circle or two circles. Um, so um, here we go. Um, this is a, an outline of the, uh, of the talk. Um, I'll first give some definitions of ergodic flows, define the geodesic flow on the tangent bundle, say some things about the hyperbolic plane, uh, hyperbolic surfaces, mainly compact ones. Um, and then in section five, I'll get into the Hopf proof of ergodicity for the geodesic flow. Um, well, actually, uh, five and six will concern that. And then um, I'll relook at Hopf meth uh, Hopf's method in, in a way which led to the concept of Anasov flows. So I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, a flow is just um, a one-parameter subgroup of homeomorphisms. Um, in the case that X is a differentiable manifold, these are the flow transformations of a vector field. So um, you can also think of them as a force field on a space. And phi sub t uh, describes where a point x is after time t. Um, OK, invariant set is one left invariant by each of the flow transformations. OK, and I got tired, actually, of writing phi of t, so I put this in. Um, an invariant measure is one for which the measure of a set A is the same as the measure of any of its translates. Is this working on its own? OK, good. I can step away from the microphone. And um, I'm assuming that all measures have been normalized so that the, uh, the measure is 1. Um, such a space is called a probability space. So let's suppose we have one and a flow on it. Um, we say that a measure mu is ergodic if for any invariant measurable set we have either measure 0 or measure 1. So there are various other ways to interpret ergodicity, and I'll go through some of them. So one way is that every invariant measurable function um, is constant almost everywhere. Uh, that's because you can approximate measurable functions by finite sums of, uh, of simple functions. OK, so in the case I'm interested in, actually, I'm about to state the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, which is a central tool and all of ergodic theory. And for this, um, at least in my case, uh, differentiable manifold is important. But in general, um, we'll assume that the, um, this, the measurable sets are the Borel sets, um, which are and the measure is finite on compact subsets. So uh, here's a statement of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. We have a Borel probability space and a flow and an L1 function. Uh, we define the forward time average F plus at a point X by letting the flow, uh, letting the point flow with time T, evaluating the function and averaging over the interval from 0 to T, and then taking the limit. And you can define the negative time average in the same way um, by flowing backwards and averaging. And then the statement of the Birkhoff ergodic theorem says that these two functions exist and are equal almost everywhere. And moreover, the integral of either f plus or f minus is the same as the integral of the original function f. So as a corollary, um, I mean, all of this, of course, is elementary. As a corollary, if you have an L1 function and an ergodic flow, then the forward time averages and the backward time averages are equal to a constant um, almost everywhere. And the constant is the integral of the function. And the proof is one line. Um, the time averages are constant all, almost everywhere. If c is the constant, you integrate it and use the Birkhoff ergodic theorem to get uh, the statement of the corollary. Um, 
A second corollary, which is a more intuitive um, or more informative description of ergodicity, is that um, if you have an ergodic flow and a set of positive measure, then for almost all x, the average amounts of time spent by the forward orbit of x and the backward orbit of x are exactly the measure of a. And the proof, again, is uh, one line. You apply the, apply the um, corollary to the characteristic function of the set a. So the integral of f d mu will be mu of a, and the integral of f plus um, will just be uh, um, the average amounts of time in the forward and backward direction. All right, so now um, I want to consider the very particular flow of the geodesic flow, uh, eventually on a negatively curved manifold, but for now, let's look at a connected Riemannian manifold. Um, to avoid complications, let's assume this metric is complete um, as a metric space. I'll use SM to denote the unit tangent bundle and mu the Riemannian measure. So the Riemannian measure is um, also the Sasaki measure as uh, discussed in the lecture of Knieper. It can also be uh, uh, described in other ways. And the most important part about it um, is that it's invariant under the geodesic flow. Um, so I'll let gamma sub v um, indicate the geodesic with initial velocity v. Um, and now here's the definition of the geodesic flow. If you start with a vector and a number t, then gt of v will do denote the velocity at time t of the geodesic. So you start with a vector, you move along it for time t, stop and take the velocity vector, and that describes gt of v. Okay, so I mentioned that already. Um, okay, here's the first of my very crude pictures. Um, I was told later that there are very nice pictures that I could have obtained had I known on the internet, but you'll have to make do with these. Um, so here's the unit disk model of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, that oval there is supposed to be a circle. Um, so uh, the hyperbolic metric in the unit disk is a conformal multiple of the Euclidean metric. Namely, it's uh, 4 times 1 over uh, 1 minus the norm squared of the Euclidean metric. So as you get close to the boundary, uh, the hyperbolic norm of a vector goes to infinity um, compared to the Euclidean norm. The, uh, the geodesics are these circles orthogonal to the boundary or the straight lines through the origin. Um, I think I've normalized this right so that the curvature is minus 1, but I confess I didn't actually check the calculation. Um, now you can also describe uh, the um, identity component of the isometry group as the set of matrices A, B, B bar, A bar, where A, B are complex numbers, with the norm of A being bigger than the norm of B. And the action is the fraction linear uh, map, which sends a point Z in the disk there to AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And you can identify um, also the um, isometry group with the unit tangent bundle. I'll go into this in more detail shortly. Um, the way in which this is done is you fix the vector. I'm going to fix the vector at the point 0, 1, which points one unit in the vertical direction. And then you apply uh, the derivative maps of uh, isometries, and you capture every other unit vector. And the action of the isometry group is simply transitive, so you can um, obtain an algebraic description of the uh, unit tangent bundle. And I'll also describe, in this fashion, the geodesic flow. So here's the other model, uh, which is well known to everyone. Um, the upper half plane model, um, you look at the, uh, the set of points x, y with the y coordinate positive. And now the, uh, the hyperbolic norm is, again, a conformal multiple of the Euclidean norm. Uh, it's 1 over the y coordinate. Um, the geodesics here are semicircles uh, orthogonal to the real line um, or vertical lines. Uh, curvature is minus 1 with this uh, choice of norm. And um, we have a different description of the identity component of the isometry group as SL2R. So real matrices now acting in the same way, Z goes to AZ plus B over CZ plus D. 
And as in the previous model, we have an identification of the unit tangent bundle and the connected component, identity component of the isometry group. Okay, so um, now Horace, uh, Horace cycles, uh, so if you start with a vector V, then you can follow it forward, so you get one point, I'll call gamma V infinity, follow it backward, you get another gamma V minus infinity. The Horace cycle determined by V is this particular uh, Euclidean circle, um, which is internally tangent to the unit disk at the point gamma V infinity. Um, it can also be realized as a level set of, of the Boosemann function determined by V, but in the interest of time, and also because this is a public lecture, whatever that means, I'm not going to define the Boosemann function. Um, now, the um, stable horosphere consists of the vectors V and all of the asymptotic vectors along that horse cycle. So that gives you a certain circle in the unit tangent bundle. Um, the horse cycle flow, which I'll call HS plus, takes a vector V and it moves it in this direction, S units. And so that particular vector is HS plus of V. We get a, a corresponding unstable Horace cycle flow, HS minus, which takes a vector V. And now we look at the Horace sphere determined by the point at minus infinity and uh, the collection of all vectors which point backwards to the same point will be called WU of V. And that's another circle in the um, unit tangent bundle. And the negative Horace cycle flow takes the vector V and it moves it. I may have moved it in the wrong direction, but it's either that way or that way. It moves it uh, a direction, uh, an amount S along the Horace cycle. And there's some relations which probably you can't see. Um, so if you conjugate the forward Horace cycle flow by GT, you get a Horace cycle transformation by another number, epsilon, depending on S and T. Uh, which becomes very small as T gets large. And basically the reason you can see this is that um, if you move forward at an amount T and then a little bit by the Horace cycle flow, it's the same as moving a Horace cycle flow S and then forward. So these two vectors, um, as T goes forward to infinity, approach each other exponentially fast. And that will become more clear. Um, we have a similar thing with the, um, with the negative Horace cycle flow. If you take two of these guys, uh, negatively asymptotic, and move them backwards, they approach each other also exponentially fast. And that is in that line, which you probably can't read. Um, on the other hand, the next page, I think I'll give you something that you can read. So here's, uh, again, the identification between uh, the upper half plane and the connected component of the isometry group. Um, if we start with a ve uh, an element G, then we map it to G star V0. That's a particular unit vector, where V0 is this vector pointing vertically one unit and attached at the point 0, 1. Um, now, in this model, the geodesic flow has a nice, des nice description. If you think of a unit tangent vector as being an element of SL2R, and you want to move it time t, that corresponds to multiplying on the right by g sub t, where, uh, where g t is this, is this matrix here. The Horace cycle flows also correspond to right translations by um, this matrix. The unstable Horace cycle um, flow, again, is a right translation um, by this particular matrix. And now, because we have everything in matrix form, we can um, exactly calculate the relations just by matrix multiplication. So you see in, in this one here, if you take the positive Horace cycle or stable Horace cycle flow and conjugate it with GT, you get HS plus goes to H plus S e to the minus T. So as T goes inf to infinity, this goes to zero exponentially fast with a corresponding relation for, and that should have been a minus corresponding relation for the negative uh, or unstable Horace cycle flow. Now, um, because of these nice relations, the, uh, at some time it became clear that 
it ought to be the case that the, horizontal, uh, the geodesic flow on a compact, uh, say, surface of curvature minus 1, um, this ought to be ergodic. And the first approach was to use this algebraic model and do clever things. Um, Hoff came along later, saw the underlying geometric meaning of what was going on, and then uh, devised a different approach, which I'll tell you about. OK, so um, now I want to talk about hyperbolic surfaces. Um, the uh, results apply equally well to uh, surfaces with finite area, but for simplicity, I'll assume that they're compact. Um, there's a covering of the uh, surface M, as is well known, by the hyperbolic plane, in which you divide out by a discrete group, and you take all the orbits of the discrete group, and, and you get the surface M. Um, and it's useful to notice that if you take the differential map, that makes a covering map of the corresponding unit tangent bundles. Is the uh, microphone still working? OK, good. Um, now, um, on the previous slide, I uh, defined the horocycle and geodesic flows on the unit tangent bundle SH. Um, these descend to flows on the, on the manifold itself because um, the covering transformations of, of, of this map pi are multiplication on the left. The Sasaki metric is a left invariant metric on SL2R. And so left and right translations commute. Now, this is the terrible. I mean, algebraically, this is why they descend. But in fact, one can define them naturally. And just for information, the, the horror cycle and geodesic flows denoted with lowercase letters uh, commute with the ones on the surface denoted with uppercase letters uh, in the way that you see. OK, and they obey the same relations whoops, as, as before. OK, now, I don't know, can you see this? Um, I'll go through this. Uh, and if you can't see it, I hope I can explain it verbally. So um, one of the things uh, that's central to the Hoff approach to ergodicity is that uh, one defines uh, special coordinates in the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. So for example, that point is the, is the origin 0, 0. Now, if you have uh, a vector v, then it determines a geodesic, which in forward time goes to x and in backward time goes to y. So you have a whole arc, a circle orthogonal to the unit disk. And now um, you need to know where the time zero point is on this geodesic. So the time zero point is uh, obtained by take, dropping a perpendicular from the center to the geodesic. And then um, you go forward or backward uh, an arc length s to get to the foot point of v. So in this fashion, you get an, uh, local coordinates for the unit tangent bundle um, as r cross x, where x is this two torus with the diagonal deleted, and the vector v is mapped to s x y in the manner that's indicated by the picture. Now, um, the next thing that Hoff did was to observe that if you have invariant subsets, flow invariant, geodesic flow invariant subsets in SH, then you get th these correspond one to one to subsets A prime and X. So, for example, if you have a, a vector V in your subset A, you give it the coordinates SXY, as I've described, and then you just map it to XY. So you, you throw away the, um, the S. Um, I should point out here that in this model, uh, if you apply the geodesic flow to V with time T, you just change S to S plus T. So movement uh, in the first coordinate here corresponds to the geodesic flow. Um, now what's important, in fact essential, is that, um, well, let's see, I haven't finished actually. So if you have a set A, it determines a set A prime. On the other hand, if you have a subset A prime, then take a point X, Y in that, that determines the geodesic. Uh, and then you don't worry about the base point because you're creating an invariant subset. So the first important point is that uh, flow invariant subsets A correspond to ordinary subsets of this torus minus that diagonal. Um, now this is actually, in the case of the hyperbolic plane, a C infinity map. 
So uh, null sets uh, A in SH um, correspond to null sets here. Uh, invariant, invariant null sets correspond to null sets here uh, in the product measure. Um, oops. Okay, this is one of these things that's not supposed to happen. There we go. Ah, all right. I thought I had skipped to the end somehow. Um, okay, now the, um, the next observation is that if you have a GT invariant function uh, on SH, that corresponds to an ordinary function on the boundary, uh, F prime, in which F prime of XY is uh, defined to be the value of f of v on any vect vector tangent to the geodesic. So since it's a, an invariant function, it doesn't matter which, which vector it is. Um, now, if you have a function and compose it, let's suppose you have a function and compose it with the uh, stable Hora cycle flow, and this leaves the function invariant for all s. Um, now, what does the stable Hora cycle flow do? in terms of these coordinates, the, the x coordinate is unchanged and the y coordinate is allowed to vary. So in this coordinate system, uh, x is fixed and y changes. Um, and so the function f prime has the property, if, if this condition is satisfied, invariance under the horse cycle flow, f prime depends only on the first coordinate. And similarly, if uh, our function is invariant under the negative Hora cycle flow, function f, that means that the function f prime uh, depends only on the second coordinate. Because as you move along the negative Hora cycle flow, this point is fixed and this one varies and the function doesn't change. So um, we're going to apply this observation to the function f plus and apply that ob observation to, my finger is too clumsy, okay. This observation will be applied to the function f minus, and then we'll use the fact that these two functions are equal almost everywhere. Okay. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, uh, I'm going to be describing part of what was done in Hoff's paper. There's the precise reference. Um, um, it's hard to find. It was published in September of 1939, which is the beginning of World War II. So this is probably why it's hard to find in libraries. Um, it's also appropriate to mention the work of Gustav Hedlund because um, he did most of the work before Hopf uh, in the case of constant negative curvature. And um, I think it was from examining these papers that uh, Hopf could see the underlying uh, geometric ideas. So um, there's a paper in which uh, Hedlund uh, describes uh, his work and the work of others. So there are actually many people who proved ergodicity of flows on surfaces of various types uh, using, what did I say? Oh, 1039, you're quite right. <laughs> Yeah, zero is next to nine. So this is, uh, yeah, this uh, predates William the Conqueror. <laughs> All right, 1939, thank you. Um, all right, so now I want to outline the proof of the ergodicity of the geodesic flow. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll assume that the measure of the unit tangent model is, is one. And then the statement in red uh, is uh, equivalent to ergodicity. Um, the first step is purely measure theoretic. Uh, you can reduce to the cases f is continuous. And because I'm looking at um, compact surfaces m, that means that f is uniformly continuous. Um, again, let's suppose we have a continuous function from, uh, from the unit tangent bundle to the reals. Then the second step is to prove that this is uh, the forward time average uh, is invariant under the stable Hora cycle flow. And similarly, the backward time average is invariant uh, under the unstable Hora cycle flow. And then the third step is to, is to lift the function from the unit tangent bundle of M to the unit tangent bundle of uh, H by this definition and prove that that uh, time average is constant almost everywhere. And then 
F tilde plus descends to F plus, and that'll prove that F plus is constant almost everywhere and finish the proof. Okay, so um, I want to prove very few things, but this is one of them. So what was step two? Step two was to prove that uh, the uh, forward time average uh, is invariant under the stable Horace cycle flow. And I'll do that one, and the uh, corresponding statement for uh, the negative time average will be similar. So here's the definition of F plus evaluated on HS plus a V. It's the limit as T goes to infinity of 1 over T times the integral from 0 to T of F of GT applied to HS plus a V. So that's the, just the definition of F plus of HS plus a V. Now, in the next statement, we use the um, commutation relations, which relate the Horace cycle and geodesic flows. And so we see that if we interchange the order, GT remains. But instead of HS plus, we have HS e to the minus T plus. And now, as T goes to infinity, uh, S e to the minus T goes to 0. And so now, for a fixed S, um, this particular vector becomes arbitrarily close to this one. And when you're computing this limit as t goes to infinity, um, uh, you use the uniform continuity. Um, so, so this vector and this vector get arbitrarily close for large t. And so by the uniform continuity, um, the red and the, and the purple here have the same limit. But uh, the purple is just the uh, definition of f plus. Okay, so this is a very um, easy proof, but it's an important one because uh, it's central to Hopf's proof that uh, we use the fact that F plus uh, is invariant under the Horace cycle flow. Okay, so yeah, there's a similar proof for F minus. Um, okay, now the third step was basically to do all the work. So we start with a continuous function, F. We lift it um, to F tilde to find this way. Um, and then it follows directly from the definitions that the forward time average of F tilde, F tilde plus, is just F plus composed with d pi. And similarly for the backward time average of F tilde. And now, again, it follows directly from the definitions um, uh, that F tilde plus is invariant under uh, F plus. Um, because of this fact here, which I proved on the previous slide. And similarly, uh, F tilde minus is invariant under the unstable uh, Horace cycle flow. OK, so now, um, well, this more or less says it all. Um, so again, x will denote this uh, torus with the diagonal removed. And uh, lambda is the product measure. Um, Sigma is the, is the normalized measure on the circle. And now, as I indicated before, a, G, a GT invariant function phi on the unit tangent bundle of H corresponds to just an arbitrary function phi tilde on X. And so we've, dis, we've, um, we've defined uh, the function F tilde plus. F tilde is the lift of F and plus is the time average. So this is an invariant function because uh, f tilde plus is invariant. So it corresponds to some function f, capital F plus on x. And just to remind you of the definition, uh, a point in x is a pair xy where x is not equal to y. The value of capital F plus on xy is just the value of this function on a vector v uh, tangent to the geodesic uh, joining x and y. Um, Similarly, we've defined f tilde minus, and so this corresponds to some function, capital F minus, on x. Uh, and again, a reminder of the definition of f minus is just f tilde minus on a vector v uh, joining y to x. Um, OK, now we're actually going to be done with the proof, or at least the outline, at the end of this uh, frame. So the fact that f tilde plus is invariant under the forward Horace cycle flow um, means that f plus 
uh, at xy is equal to f plus at xy prime because as you move along the uh, stable horocycle flow, the x is fixed and the y changes. But now um, this really means that f plus depends only on the first coordinate. And now similarly the fact that the negative time average of f tilde commutes with the, or is invariant under the negative, uh, the unstable horocycle flow implies that the corresponding function on x, f minus, um, has the property that if you change the x coordinate and leave the y coordinate fixed, uh, the values don't change. That means that f minus depends only on the second coordinate. Okay, well now, the, um, so this statement without the tildes was true on m by the Birkhoff ergodic theorem but it follows formally from the definitions of the tilde functions. And so the fact that these are true almost everywhere means that f plus equals f minus almost everywhere on x. And here we use the fact that null sets on sh are mapped to null sets on x. So this is the important part of the proof. Now let's look at 1 and 2. Um, f plus and f minus are equal almost everywhere f plus depends only on the first coordinate, f minus depends only on the second coordinate, so f plus is invariant of both coordinates, and that means it's constant almost everywhere. So, now from this, um, f plus is constant, it corresponded to f tilde plus, so that's constant almost everywhere on sh. Again, using the fact that null sets over here map to null sets over here, and then you push down this function and you at, uh, arrive at the conclusion that f plus is constant almost everywhere on SM. So that's Hopf's proof. So it's, it's very nice. Um, it depended on a couple of things. It depended on um, local coordinates for the unit tangent bundle, uh, which map null sets to null sets. Okay, now I want to explain how these things generalize to negative curvature and what the problems in the generalization are. So here M will be a Riemannian manifold P a point. Um, I want to define sectional curvature, which I think is probably known to everyone, but it's here on the slide, so I'll do it. Um, you take a two-dimensional subspace of the tangent plane, and now from this you get a surface. So if you're given, so if my hand is a two-dimensional subspace, I take all the geodesics through this point, which are tangent to the plane, and I get a, a surface contained in M, I take the Gaussian curvature of that surface, and uh, I define that to be the sectional curvature. And so uh, we say that M is negative curvature, or negative sectional curvature, if this number is uh, negative for all two planes. Now our, our hypothesis is that M is compact, so the unit tangent bundle is compact, and the two-dimensional subspaces are compact, so in fact, we can get a uniform upper bound for all of these negative numbers. And by normalizing, I'm going to assume that it's minus 1. OK, so now I want to talk some, uh, say something about spaces which are compact with curvature less than or equal to minus 1. So we'll let m tilde denote uh, the universal Riemannian cover, and pi the covering map, gamma the deck group. Now, one of the key facts about such spaces is that for any two points, there is a unique geodesic that joins P to Q. This, in fact, is true for curvature less than or equal to zero. It's the theorem of uh, Adamar Carton. Um, and now, um, in the hyperbolic plane, uh, we had an obvious notion of asymptotic geodesic. Now we need something more geometric to work on, so we say that two geodesics, uh, and by geodesics I mean unit speed geodesics. They're asymptotic if uh, the distance in forward time uh, t remains bounded for all t greater than or equal to zero. And they're negatively asymptotic if, if in the backward time the distance between the corresponding t points, t points is bounded, yes, for all t less than or equal to zero. And then we want a notion of asymptotic uh, um, in the unit tangent bundle. And um, so 
let me do something which is intrinsic. Um, the vectors are asymptotic if when you apply the geodesic flow, uh, they again remain bounded a distance apart um, for all t greater than or equal to zero. See, this, this d now denotes the Sasaki metric, and the previous d denoted the Riemannian metric. And they're strongly asymptotic if the distance between uh, the vectors goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Um, similarly, uh, we have a notion of negatively asymptotic. Um, if, if you let the geodesic flow take them in backward time and they remain uh, a bounded distance apart um, for all t in the negative direction and some positive constant, and they're strongly negatively asymptotic if the distance between them goes to zero uh, in backward time. Um, and then it's a fact that if you have asymptotic vectors, then you can move one of them by the geodesic flow at time t, um, and you'll get things that are strongly asymptotic or strongly negatively asymptotic. Okay, so a lot of definitions. Um, again, a picture. So these two vectors are asymptotic. Uh, so again, think of this as being the hyperbolic plane. Um, it's the same picture as before, but now thought of in a slightly different way. Strongly asymptotic means they go to the same point at infinity, but they lie on the same horror cycle. Um, similarly, with negatively asymptotic, they go backward to the same point. And strongly neg negatively asymptotic, if you draw a horror cycle uh, at the backward point, uh, they both lie on the same horror cycle. And the fact that these geometric descriptions fit the definition follows from the commutation relations between the geodesic flow and the horror cycle flow. And an obvious point, well, maybe not obvious, but it's equivalent. Uh, you can say that vectors V and W are asymptotic if the corresponding geodesics are asymptotic. So um, now here's a, here's a key fact. Um, we, we want to construct some sort of boundary sphere at infinity in which a boundary point is uh, an equivalence class of uh, asymptotic geodesics. So uh, in order to make this work, we need the following lemma, that if we have any two points and a vector, say, v at one of them, then there exists a unique vector, w, at the other, which is asymptotic to v. So we have, uh, in fact, a homeomorphism which takes a unit vector at p to a unique asymptotic unit vector at q, uh, say w. Um, OK, so we get a homeomorphism here. And now here uh, is the way to construct the sphere at infinity. Um, so this is just a review of what I said. Um, we have a, a, a homeomorphism between the unit spheres uh, at p and q. Um, the boundary sphere at infinity consists of the asymptotic uh, equivalence classes of asymptotic vectors. And now we use the fact um, from up here that uh, we get a bijection between the unit tangent vectors at p and the equivalence classes. So um, each vector determines an equivalence class. And given an asymptotic equivalence class, there's a unique vector here. So we have a bijection. We have a topology here. Um, so we transfer this so that this bijection is a homeomorphism. And it doesn't depend on the base point because the map between P and Q is a homeomorphism. So right. So this sphere topology is independent of P. And if you have uh, pinching conditions on K, you can say more about that. But those are not relevant to this lecture. Okay, so now I want to do the same picture, essentially. I'm going to use the same picture as in the hyperbolic plane. This time, instead of uh, S1, this is going to be uh, the boundary sphere at infinity. But again, we have the same kind of coordinates. Um, um, so again, one can show that given any two equivalence classes, I should start down here, given two equivalence classes, which are different, I can find a geodesic which in the forward direction belongs to one equivalence class, in the backward direction belongs to another. So if you think of uh, this as an n minus 1 sphere, it means that given any two points, x and y, 
on this boundary, I can find a geodesic which joins them. And again, uh, I can fix a base point, drop a perpendicular from there to the geodesic. That determines the time zero point. And then going from here to here determines the distance s along the geodesic. So again, I have a map local coordinates for the unit tangent model of s uh, m tilde in which a vector v goes into s x y. x is the forward asymptote class and y is the backward asymptote class. And now um, x instead of being s1 cross s1 minus delta is m tilde fil uh, infinity. There should be a tilde there. Again minus the diagonal. And let's see, I guess we've already done that. So Basically, what Hoff did was he used the same picture um, and did all of this in dimension two. So he proved this statement here that given two equivalence classes, you can find a geodesic joining one in the forward direction and another in the backward direction. And um, later on, it was proved that this was true not only in dimension two, but in arbitrary dimensions. So um, I've forgotten what's here. Okay. So, so now we have these uh, special local coordinates. A vector v goes into a number and, and two coordinates x and y. Uh, the geodesic flow from the previous picture corresponds to a translation in this first coordinate. So gt of v is s plus t of x, y. And now uh, I want to note for future reference that uh, movement along uh, stable asymptotes corresponds to a movement in the y coordinate. So x is the uh, asymptote class in the forward direction. Moving along stable asymptotes corresponds to uh, changing the y coordinate. And similarly, moving along unstable asymptotes means you're fixing the y coordinate, changing the x coordinate. So we can reproduce a whole lot of what Hoff did, and in fact, he thought of this. Um, so invariant subsets in the unit tangent model, again, correspond to uh, subsets, arbitrary subsets A prime in this space X. Um, again, uh, a vector SXY is just mapped to XY, the pair of endpoints at infinity. Um, as before, uh, functions invariant under the geodesic flow correspond to arbitrary functions f prime uh, from x to the reals. So f prime of xy will just be f of v, where v is tangent to this geodesic. And if you replace this by gt of v, you don't change anything because it's invariant. And now here's the problem. Um, what you need to make his proof work is... Uh, in these coordinates, you need to know that uh, null sets in the unit tangent bundle, um, in, invariant null sets in the unit tangent bundle correspond to null sets over here with respect to the product measure. So this was the problem confronting Hopf. He did it in n equals 2 by a very nice argument. He, he actually showed that this particular set of local coordinates is C1. So the C1 in, in, ensures uh, a yes answer here. But he couldn't do it in uh, higher dimensions. And for a familiar reason, he couldn't do it because it was false. Um, so it was maybe 25 years later that Anasov and Sinai, working in a much more general context, proved that these uh, coordinates were absolutely continuous. So null sets were carried to null sets in all dimensions greater than or equal to 3. Um, so now I want to uh, recast things in a way that was made use of by Anosov and Sinai. So let's call WSS of V to be the set of vectors W in the unit tangent model of M, which are strongly asymptotic to V. ESS will be the tangent space at V of this subset. We'll do a similar thing for unstable vectors. Uh, WUU of V is the set of W which are strongly negatively asymptotic to V. E U U of V will be the tangent space of this. Um, so W S S and W U U are, are manifolds because they're horospheres. And now we have one other player in the game. Um, 
we look at the one-dimensional geodesic flow orbit, and call that V of V, and let's set Z of V be the, the tangent uh, space at V. And now it's very easy to prove that the tangent space of the unit tangent model of M is a direct sum of these three subspaces. And moreover, we have some relations which, uh, in the case of the hyperbolic plane, uh, there's an equality here. Um, in the case of curvature less than or equal to minus one, um, oops, there's an inequality because one uses comparison arguments in Riemannian geometry. So what, what happens is that if, uh, let's see if I can do this better. Um, if you take a vector zeta, which is in ESS, uh, it's contracted exponentially in length by the forward geodesic flow. Um, as I mentioned, in the hyperbolic plane, that comes from the commutation relations between the horror cycle and geodesic flows. And similarly, if you take a vector in EUU, it's expanded uh, exponentially in the forward direction. So um, this is another way of looking at the geodesic flow in a way that's useful for generalization. Um, so in the case we've just been talking about, WSS of V is, a, is an actual orbit of a flow, and w, the, the positive or stable horocycle floor, and WUU, uh, these sets are orbits of the um, negative or unstable horocycle flow. Now let's suppose that we have a flow on a Riemannian manifold X, let's say compact, I didn't put that in, and suppose we have uh, some invariant foliations, ESS, EUU. By invariant, I mean that um, ESS uh, at a point phi t of x is equal to phi t of ESS of x, or the differential map. Um, and suppose uh, at each point x, we have the same kind of decomposition satisfying the same exponential contraction and expansion relations. Um, so these flows were uh, in an Ossoff's book called U-flows. Um, later they became uh, called an Ossoff or uniformly hyperbolic flows. And um, I'm going to give you a very, very brief description of what they did. Um, in this more general context, they followed the um, initiative or the idea of Hopf by constructing an X local coordinates, uh, TSU, in which movement in the first coordinate corresponds to moving uh, along the flow. Movement in the second coordinate, S, corresponds to moving along a leaf of the stable foliation. So these foliations are actually integrable. And movement in the third coordinate, U going to TSU, corresponds to moving along a leaf of the unstable foliation. So um, in this general context, one can have local coordinates of this type. And um, what they showed is that these adapted coordinate systems are not C1, uh, but they do carry null sets in X into null sets in this parameter space. Uh, this allowed Hopf's proof of ergodicity to go through uh, in this much more general setting, and they proved a whole lot more. Um, very subtle problems of flows and diffeomorphism, such as mixing. And this work is still ongoing, spurred in large part by the work of Hopf, and that's all.
I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. My knowledge of physics is unfortunately rather limited. Um, however, I can say that ergodic things are fairly frequent. Um, and maybe that's some sort of answer, but maybe there's somebody else that can answer that question. Uh huh. But no one ever doubts systems like that. I mean, it stands to reason without uh, going through it. I mean, I'm not able to get that uh, grip on that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a frequent that uh, obviously, uh, when you want to apply to a system of hard spheres, something has to fit uh, so that hard uh, ellipsoids are not existing. I'm fairly certain that the, the Russians have modeled this and answered the question, but I don't know what the answer is. And sorry. Part of the theorem of billiards in the general sense. Billiards. Yeah. Like for example, the negative temperature hyperbole, I mean, there, chaos is discussing those terms. But this recordance uh, theory, uh, something that no physicist ever does, but only one case has been proven. And even that only for the spheres. Um, I wish I could. I'm not sure it's actually th th that there exists an airtight proof today because I know um, and also I wrote down a very long proof and then uh, Misha Brin at some point wanted to expand on gaps that he found in the uh, in the Anosov proof, and he wrote something very long. And then I confess I didn't completely read his proof, but someone else told me that he thought there were gaps in Bryn's proof. So it's, I think it's universally accepted as a true statement, but very hard to prove. I, I may be unfair to Misha Bryn. I call for Gothic theorem, but I could have equally well used uh, the finite area hypothesis. I mean, I, it's not I that used it, it's uh, Hoff that used it. Um, well, that was another reason I took compact, because if you approximate by continuous functions, then they're automatically uniformly continuous. But in fact, Hoff uh, used a, an approximation in the finite area case by uniformly continuous functions. and. Um, I hadn't actually seen this in my studies. I assume it's correct, but I didn't work my way through it. So basically what you need is to, is to move from the arbitrary measurable case and reduce to the uniformly continuous case. <laughs>